are The God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination or organization whatsoever. We read the word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men which Yahusha himself rebuked. Yahusha said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, 9. This is our journey through the Word, and we are restoring the name of God, Yahuwah, in our worship and His Son, Yahusha. The findings in this video, though, are monumental, and really, this will serve as an introduction to the next portion of our Lost Tribes series as well, as we are going to explore the name of Yah's people, God's people. There is so much deception and confusion on this topic, but by the end of this video, you will understand what Yahuwah God calls His people and what He does not. We have said before, his people never called themselves Jews. But can we prove this? Actually, yes, we can. And you will be able to as well. So, let's break it down. And by the way, we are going to deal not only with the Hebrew of this word, but the Greek. And you are going to notice something very suspicious here because someone has been monkeying around with the word. We are going to break down the origin of the word Jehovah in another video, but let's deal with this J. I know many seem to idolize the Masoretes, but before the Masoretes, the Bible for thousands of years never had vows nor did it need them. That's an important distinction. It is they that added these vow points, and much confusion has stemmed from this, because somehow, in this day and age, there is a general acceptance of their pronunciations, which are wrong, which we have proven already with the name of the Father, the Son, and even the Prophet. Many do not realize these were Pharisees, and they did what Pharisees do. They add to the word, expanding it with their leaven. It's just what they do, according to Yahusha, Jesus. Again, we'll cover the pronunciation of Jehovah, which we have already proven wrong principally, but for this video, let's start with the first letter, because it all goes downhill from there, with many accepted words today, though they are all wrong. And we're not hesitating in saying that. They're wrong. If they have a non-Hebrew, non-Greek, non-Aramaic, and non-Latin letter, from ancient times in which the Bible was written, then they are wrong. We are told the J comes from Latin. We'll show you that is also very misleading, as ancient Latin also had no J, and we prove it. Here is the Hebrew and Greek chart we have been using from ancienthebrew.org, a Jewish, reputable source. Again, note, there is no J in ancient Hebrew and Greek. No J. Aramaic is not on this chart, but still you will find no J in ancient Aramaic either. And Latin had a J according to this chart, but we will show when it came to be, because there was no J in ancient Latin all the way up until the Renaissance, around the 1500s AD. Even modern Hebrew on this chart has no J. 
So they're adding it even now, though it has been infused into pronunciations, hasn't it? Because they're not really using Hebrew. That's not what that language is in those cases. But this Jewish chart and most others do not recognize a J even in modern Hebrew. Some question this chart as if it may not be complete. So, let's look at history and let's prove this out. As of 700 BC, there was no J in Greek. Take a look at the chart. Do you see one? No. See, Latin is derived, really, from the Greek, which also had what? No J. Either one. That is its beginning, and this is indisputable. And important to understand, because an infusion of a modern language, especially originating from the synagogue of Satan, is probably not the best way to transliterate biblical words, is it? In 100 BC, after the translation of the Greek Septuagint, which is really the Old Testament translated from the Hebrew into the Greek, a hundred years earlier, still no J in Latin, none. However, there was a Y sound. Hmm. So, when they were transliterating Yahuwah and Yahusha, there actually was an equivalent, at least to the Y and most of the letters, in Greek, wasn't there? Which also means it was in Latin. Hmm. See how they adopted new letters to write loan words from other prominent languages? This is not uncommon, and as a practice, not problematic, really. Just when you apply it to the origin of the Bible and the actual name of God, which you not only change, but you remove it completely from Scripture almost 7,000 times. Now, that is called evil. There's no other way to justify that. However, we are supposed to believe for the name of God and the Son and the prophets, people just could not pronounce a Y sound, even though Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and Aramaic all have a Y sound. And by the way, so does English, French, German, all these languages for that matter. So why would you replace a known letter that was consistent in all of the languages with a J? We'll show you. So when you have a word that originated in Hebrew, why would you change a letter that still exists in the language you are translating it into? I mean, aren't you trying to copy the word from its original language and source? I mean, isn't that the way transliteration, which is really translation, shouldn't be transliteration, should be translation, because the same letters are principally there. The answer, we will show you in the Greek and the Greek Septuagint. In fact, they had no challenge with this. This was not an issue. It was easily resolved and it was seamless. And the word, we are told, somehow thousands of years later becomes Jew. Well, it may surprise you, but it's not Jew in any sense. Not one letter. Oh, and look, in 100 BC, the Y sound came from the I, which is what we see in the Greek Septuagint and in the Greek in every concordance we've ever seen. So, is it a J? No. We're not going to get into technical terms, and we are not linguists, but you will find our research is compelling, and you may want to consider testing everything you hear, especially 
from so-called linguists and scholars, for that matter. Many are Pharisees themselves, and they have been adding and adding to languages, to stories, to the word all along. It's what they do. They leaven it. They expand it. That is, if you believe the words of Messiah, because Yahushua said that's what they do. So, I and Y are interchangeable as of 100 BC when the Greek Septuagint was written, basically. So, was there a need to introduce a J into that? No. And again, do you see a J on this chart? Nope. It was not in the alphabet and certainly wasn't the I or iota. So, where did this J come from and when did it enter the picture? We'll certainly show you. Not in the time the Bible was written, nor in the time of Messiah, for sure. Remember, we also told you there was no V in ancient Hebrew, according to ancienthebrew.org, right? The reliable Jewish source, right? So, well, there was also no V in ancient Latin until between 470 A.D., and 1500 A.D. What happened around 470 A.D.? The Roman Empire fell. But wait a minute. What does that mean according to Daniel's statue, which we'll cover in our next Lost Tribes series? Well, that means a new empire, a final empire, the one that goes all the way to the end without a break, takes power. Now, that is a very interesting point to note the changing of language. This was to accommodate Germanic languages, but still, there was no J. But in the 1300s to 1600s, at some point, Latin then began accommodating these Germanic languages further and began applying J as a sound for the I, iota, when used as a consonant and the U as a V. So, that means neither was used in ancient Latin nor in the Roman Empire. We can date it all the way to there. It's the final empire who changes the name of God completely. It had already been erased from the Bible. But now, they're telling you it says something different from what it actually says. Now, neither would truly represent the pronunciation of anything biblical in any case whatsoever, because the Bible was written when? Before 470 A.D., right? There was no J, nor V, in ancient Latin until long after the Bible was written, even long after the Greek Septuagint was translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. Some actual, actually attempt to make the case that J is the English pronunciation of the Latin I, as if that is a, an actual rule. And certainly some do and claim it is, but that's modern, even for English. And these are ancient names, not of Latin origin. And there is absolutely no reason one would need to do that when English certainly has a Y, doesn't it? Does it matter? If it were an innocent mistake, perhaps? One could marginalize this. But wait till you see what this makes room for. This is Pharisee leaven that we were warned about. In fact, 
linguists are well aware that the eyes used in this inscription from 40 BC from the Mazias Mithridates gate in Ephesus is not a J in pronunciation. Here's a pronunciation from a scholar who will give you the modern pronunciation, which is false and added to with Pharisee leaven for a reason, which we will expose, and the real one in ancient Latin. This is proof. Gaius Iurius Caesar. Gaius Iurius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Gaius Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. See? It's a Y sound for the I, O iota, not a J. Again, if the Y sound did not exist in Latin, it may be understandable, but it did. So it is not. What exactly is this making room for? It says Germanic languages. What Germanic languages was this making room for? Well, specifically, the language of the Ashkenazi Jews who migrated into Europe, into France, into Germany from the Russian steppes. That's who, and that's the origin of the J we'll show you. A 16th century German Christian scribe, you mean Pharisee, because Christian scribes are many times Pharisees too, as they infiltrated the church a long time ago, actually really from the beginning, while transliterating the Bible into Latin for the Pope, wrote the name out as it appeared in his text with the consonants of YH. V-H. Again, the V is wrong, too. And the vowels of Adonai. And came up with the word Jehovah. J is pronounced Y in German, by the way. So, no, it was Yehovah, even in this instance. And the name stuck. Amazing. How stupid some historians think we are, that this is the kind of scenario in which the name Jehovah arrived, and it, well, it stuck. So, that's it. Everybody just accepted it, because no one really cares what the name of God actually is, right? And no one was worshiping him on all of earth, so obviously everybody forgot how to say his name. Could you be more stupid? That is the dumbest logic I have ever heard. And yet we see this in history all the time. Why? Because this is not a dumb person. This is a Pharisee writing this, and they are trying to mislead you. And we would be the stupid ones if we fall for this kind of stuff. The name stuck. Well, that just sounds nice and historic, doesn't it? That's history, really? This is the kind of complete deception historians peddle at times. But notice, even German, in those days, pronounced the letter J as a Y, not a J. So the name, even then, though wrong, definitely did not begin with a J sound. And this was 1600. AD. That was not that long ago in history. So how does it get there now? What a mess. Look at the, sorry for the word, but stupid rationale here. Using the letters of one Hebrew word and inserting the letters from another into it. Well, wait a minute. I thought Hebrew had no vowel points before. So how do you even know that those vowel points were right? And by the way, didn't the Masoretes translate the Bible with vowel points before the 1600s? Well, yes, of course. So this reference is actually based on 
pretty much absolute nonsense. There's actually very little truth. It's lined with a little truth, but mostly leaven to this article. Does this make any sense to you? This is the name of Yahuwah God? No. Some arbitrary, meaningless name which just kind of stuck. That's it. Ah, it's, we're just talking about the name of God here. It, it, it's not that important. Come on. Are you kidding? Were these guys really that oblivious? No. Well, they were in a sense, and they still are because this guy was a Pharisee who was really applying the Pharisee doctrine of not pronouncing the name Yahuwah deceptively for you and I. So he applied an extremely ignorant methodology of inserting the letters of one word into another, which is not logic at all. It's just utter stupidity. There's nothing scholarly about such a stupid act. Were they really that clueless? And who was this guy anyway? Peter Galatin, confessor to Pope Leo X. While transliterating the Bible into Latin for him in 1518, the Jesuits, by the way, were the confessors to the popes, the kings, and the princes, but they weren't formed yet until 1534 or so technically, but this guy is one of the forerunners indeed. He is even known for knowing Kabbalah, so well he formed an argument for Jews to become Christians. Hmm, that's because he was a Pharisee. But remember, the Masoretes had already formed this word Jehovah in their margin notes 600 or so years before this. So he was really just peddling their Pharisee doctrine in taking the letters of Adonai and placing them into YHVH, which again, it's W, not V, to form Jehovah, or really it's Yehovah is what it was. That's what it was. That's how it was pronounced even at that point. This whole account reeks of a disgusting odor, frankly, either way. Changing the name of Yahuwah God is unacceptable, period. But the addition of the J was an accommodation for Germanic languages. Was that German? The consonant J started to have a distinctive use in the High Middle German spoken between 1050 and 1350 A.D. And it was not until the 16th century that the consonant J began to be considered as having a distinct phonetic value. So the 1500s, you know, the era in which the Jesuit order or Society of Jesus was founded by a Kabbalist, Murano Jew, Ignatius Loyola. It was the Italian grammatician Gian Giorgio Tresino, 1478 to 1550, the first to distinguish between the letters I and J as representing different sounds, really late in the game, and fairly modernly. The consonant J was the last letter to be incorporated in the Latin alphabet by Pierre de la Ramie, 1515 to 1572, the last letter, got that? To distinguish it from the phonetic value that the vowel I had developed in Romance languages. The introduction of J in modern English occurred. Whoa, 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 whoa. English occurred when? In the late 17th century. So there was wasn't even a J in ancient English until the 1600s. Wow, this just keeps getting worse and worse, doesn't it? So why are we using a J today? Hmm. Because the Germanic language they refer to is Yiddish, which just 
Look at the word. Look at the pronunciation rendering on screen in Yiddish. That's where the I and J are interchangeable. That's the word Yiddish, which is synonymous with Jewish, Jiddish. It's the same word. One who is Jewish is Yiddish, not Hebrew, not from Israel. But we'll prove that out further in another video. So indisputably, it will be very hard to dispute. Yiddish is the language of the Ashkenazi Jew, and though it's called a Germanic language, its origin and the origin of the Ashkenazi is the Russian steppes, not Germany and not Israel, really. Yiddish, or really Jewish, is fused with elements taken from Hebrew and Aramaic. Taken from, meaning it's not either. As well as from Slavic languages. Wait a minute. Who are the Slavs? The Slavs are those of Eastern Europe, the Russian steppes. Not Israel. And traces of Romance languages. No, not the language of love but that of the Romans, romance, roman, romance. It means these derive from Latin. So, we know Latin had no J in ancient times, and it derived from Greek, which had no J in ancient times. In a previous video, we saw that Greek comes from Really, they say the Phoenician language, really very similar to ancient Paleo-Hebrew, especially in letters and phonetic sounds and alphabet, indeed. So, nor did Hebrew nor Greek have a J. And this is an infusing of these languages, these ancient languages, with Slavic languages from the Russian steppes, otherwise known as Turkic. You may have heard that word. That doesn't mean Turkey. Turkic is the entire area. Yes, it could include Turkey, but the entire area of the Russian steppes. It could even include Russia in some connotations. So, if Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin had no J before this infusion, which is the dominant language here, Slavic or Turkic, where did the J come from? Well, it came from Slavic because it didn't come from Hebrew, it didn't come from Aramaic, it didn't come from Latin, it didn't come from ancient German, ancient French, nor ancient English. Are you getting this pattern? How clear the distinction is as to where exactly this came from? So we know the J did not originate in any biblical language whatsoever. Just look at the Yiddish alphabet for a second. Here's the Yiddish language chart, and now you can see for yourself the root of the J, which they call Yud. Replace the Yad. No, never Yod. It's Yad is the ancient Hebrew letter which is a Y sound, never a J, as well as the V replacing U or W. See, this is the source, although this has a source because this language is still newer in history, and these people migrated even to the Russian steppes and even into Israel for a short time from Persia, and we will prove that in another video. We can't do that here. So, if someone is telling you Yahuwah, Yahusha, Eliyahu, and we're about to cover Yahuda and Yahudim, God's people, Yah's people, starts with a J or includes a J whatever, like Messiah is Jesus, no, or I am a Jew practicing Judaism from the tribe of Judah, from Judea in Jerusalem. <laughs> I mean, this is really screwed up. 
just doesn't know what they are talking about. Because all of those are wrong. There cannot, there is not, there never was a J. Period. Notice the string of J's thrown in our face, and it's wrong every time. And that is on purpose. They are actually saying, screaming, I am Yiddish, Jewish, not Hebrew. From the Russian steps, though we'll prove Medo-Persia originally, and they're the replacements who moved into the northern kingdom in Samaria, the Samaritans, who worshipped other gods. Yes, we find the god that they bring in, and they still call him by that name today, and we'll show you. In fact, we'll prove what they are really saying is, I don't understand Hebrew, nor do I care because I'm not Hebrew, but I apply my Russian language to it, as if that's okay. It's not, and it leads to a great deception, or we wouldn't even bother with this video, which we are about to uncover. Now, this migration of Yiddish was so strong, think about this, that it literally changed Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, French, and even English, for that matter. How can this be? Why? Well, Martin Luther actually tells us quite a bit about this. In his book, Branded Anti-Semitic, yet they're not even Semites or from Shem, Shemites, on the Jews and their lies. Now, that sounds like a rough title. We agree. But you got to remember, the Counter-Reformation, the opposition to Luther, was led by Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus. But what was he? Well, he was a Murano, Kabbalist, Basque, Jew. So who's he calling a liar? Well, he's calling Ignatius Loyola a liar. And so do we. Because this is the source. See, Loyola, the Jesuits, took over in the early 1500s. And all of this happened shortly after that. Imagine that. Are Jesuits the source? No. No, 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 no. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, with, with, with the principalities and powers of darkness, the dark rulers of this world. That's the source. Are Jews the source? No. They're the pawns. Are all Jews in on this? No. Most have no clue and are just as deceived as you and I have been for many years, as seminaries are. But they forced their language from the land of Ashkenaz, which in our next videos in the Lost Tribes series, we'll show you exactly where that land is. And we'll show you which demon, which prince, principality, controls it. And this will blow your mind. But they inject that into Bible interpretation, and we can see plainly the era involved and just who did it. They are all Pharisees. Yes, they call themselves Jesuits, but they're Pharisees. They're Kabbalist Jews, and they follow that ideology. Not Christianity. And we have already identified where the lost tribes of Israel migrated in our Lost Tribe series. And it doesn't fit the Pharisee, Ashkenazi, nor Sephardic migration patterns. Now, we're going to prove that out further. We'll map it out, just as we do. You know that. And by the time we're done, you'll have no doubt. And that's not the so-called regathering, of which to say modern Israel represents the tribes of Israel. Which would be to say Isaiah is over 70% wrong in his prophecy. 
That's called blasphemy. <laughs> Isaiah is never wrong in prophecy, especially not to that large of a degree, because that says Isaiah was wrong. Isaiah was not right. No, no, no. Isaiah's right. The Pharisees are more than 70% wrong. That is the problem here. You see, they never proved anything because they didn't have to. Because they took a land that was handed to them, really in 1917, by the Balfour Declaration as payment to the Rothschilds, Ashkenazi Jews, who were handed Israel as payment for bringing the U.S. into World War I. And that is very well documented. Yiddish, or really Jewish, again, are one and the same. Most Jews call themselves Ashkenazi, and we know where the term originates. Genesis 10, in the Table of Nations. This is an ancient name. It's an ancient word. And no, you don't use it and rebrand it as something it's not. No, no, no. It says exactly what it is. Ashkenaz is the son of Gomer, son of Japheth. And he was given a territory, which we'll prove to you, according to the Book of Jubilees, in the Russian steppes. But let's dive into the biblical words used for Yah's, Yahuwah's, people. Let's start with the tribe of Judah, so we are told. But we already know there's no J, so it's not Judah, is it? That's wrong. The meaning, even from Strong's Concordance, and most sources we reviewed, means praised. And no, that's not quite accurate either. But let's break this down. What does Judah start with in Hebrew? Yad, He, Wa. Imagine that. Wait, that sounds familiar. That's the shortened name of Yahuwah. It's Yahu. You got to be kidding me. He put his name on this people? They are precious to him indeed. Then, Dal, or modern Dalet, D. So it's pronounced thus far, Yahud, not Judah, is it? But Judah's really off, isn't it? Oh yeah, it is in several ways. It's not the right word. It's misleading purposely. And it ends with another hey, ah. Funny, it's actually the exact same name as Yahuwah, with a D, a Dal, a Dalit, in the middle, isn't it? And that's the only difference. So, why would it be pronounced any other way? Well, it wouldn't. That's called chaos and confusion, and not having any standards applied to the language. And that is a sad case. So it's Yahuda. Now, in all fairness, most sources we reviewed agree this is actually the pronunciation, Yahuda. Yet some of the same then say Yahu is not Y H Y A H U, it's Y A H W for Yahweh. Well, that's nonsense. See, you would have to apply that here then. You would have to apply that in every instance. You know, it'd be Eli Yahu would now be Eli Yahu. Huh? No, nonsense. Their inconsistent behavior patterns are so confusing and so evident. This is deception and needs to be unraveled. Don't worry, we shall. So the word we know as Judah is actually Yahuda. So who's being praised here? The Jews? Well, they seem to think so when you read the Talmud. And we read a passage earlier in the series that clearly says they believe the Jews should be worshipped, even by Yahusha. Oh yeah, that's what it says. Go back and watch that. Can this even be shortened to Jews? Not on your life. 
Only if you created, well, let's say another language with different rules and different sounds and different letters, which they did wrongly, and then ignored the Bible because it actually tells us what Judah or really Yahuda means. It defines Yehuda. So throw out every concordance. You don't need them for this definition. You have the Bible because when Leah birthed Yahuda, she said what the name means. Does she say, I will praise? And that's it? No. Does she say, I will praise Judah, Yehuda? No. What does it say? She said, now I will praise Yahuwah. When you see the word Lord, it's Yahuwah. It's a replacement for Yad, He, Wah, He, Yh, Wh, Yahuwah. If anyone defines a word to you differently from the way the Bible defines it, something is wrong. Test it. That's not a name that a believer would carry. Yet read the Talmud, as we offered before, and one would think we are supposed to praise Judah, Yehuda, not Yahuwah. And Judah's bloodline of Jews, those in Judaism are who is praised if you really look and get down to the bottom of it. No Thank you. Now, this is just one tribe of 12, but the one that Ashkenazi is known to identify with more often than any other from everything that we've read and seen over the years. But what did Yahuwah God call his people? We see the term Israelites, but that just simply refers to the descendants of Israel. Jacob. Yahuwah renamed Jacob Israel. That's the origin of that. And pretty easy. We're not even going to cover that here. Did you know the word interpreted Jew or Jews is used 74 times in the Old Testament? Many don't know that. Many think it came from the Greek, and that's the origin of the word, but that's not. It has Hebrew origins which should be obvious as it's a name for, well, Hebrews who spoke, oh, I don't know, maybe Hebrew. And it's not new. The actual Hebrew word sure looks similar, but Strong's Concordance, and most, especially all the Jewish sources, will tell you this is pronounced Yehudi, or similar, or in plural, Yehudim. Yeh, not Yah, Yeh. However, once again, this fails the test of scriptural precedence. And there's a reason for that. Because they also claim a Jew is one from the tribe of Judah, right? Well, that's not necessarily wrong, but misleading. Once you pronounce it right, But the other way around is really nonsense. Yehudim, Yahudim really, and we'll show you, we'll correct this, are not solely the tribe of Judah. And that's according to, well, the source, scripture, the word. But this is a reference to all of Yahuwah's, Yah's people and It actually bears his name, and he put it there. We'll prove it. It starts with, oh, wait, wait, this is monumental. It's, I I can't imagine what this could actually say. Yod, hey, wah. Where have we seen that before? It's Yahoo, short for Yahuwah. It's not Yehu. Yehu, however you want to say it. That's against the Bible, but no surprise, those who Yahusha warned 
follow a religion against his commandments would certainly do so. Then, it's D, Dal Dalit. So it's Yahoo, just like the tribe so far. But it ends differently with a Yad, which is IY in this instance. So it's pronounced Yahudi, not Yehudi. And yes, there is a massive difference because they are trying to lead us to this word, this new word, this ridiculous metamorphosis, which we'll show you for some reason, but why, I wonder. And, of course, they are erasing the very name of Yah or Yahu in the process, which is a standard doctrine of Judaism, which we already showed you in their own words, with some actually claiming the penalty of being unable to enter heaven, if you dare even pronounce it. What nonsense. But we'll get there. And it's made plural as Yahudim. We are told this is Jews. Read my lips. Uh Uh-uh. So it's not Yehudim or Yehudi. It's Yahudi and Yahudim, plural. Because Yahuwah branded his people with his name. And yes, it's okay to shorten it. But Yahudim doesn't shorten to Jew or Jews, does it? It shortens to something much better, something more telling, something far more meaningful. Yas. These are Yas people. His name is on them. We are Yas people, whether part of the 12 tribes in relationship with him, or those grafted in. We are Yahs. Wow. Why would anyone want to remove that? And the fact that they would tells you they are not Yahs people indeed. See how nicely all this ties? Rather than this chaotic system, where they even add uh, uh, in, in... Yehudim, you saw them, it, it's, it's Y-E-H, okay, the E's wrong, and then they add a W in there, U-W, well, is it U or is it W, which is it? The letter's either U or the letter's, the letter's W, it's not both. Why do they add that W in there? Well, so they can get to the E and the U, pulling it from the word, which doesn't even make any remote sense. It would be yes not Jews. Jews is stupid. It is one of the worst transliterations I believe I've ever seen. It pretty much is on the same scale as as words like Jesus and Jehovah. I mean, these are all ridiculous, every single one of them. And we've proven to you that the J is not there. So it's not J. The E is not there. So it's not J-E. And the W is not there. It's just a U. That's it. So the three letters of the name are not there. What does that mean? It means it's foolishness, it's deception, it's chaos, it's nonsense. And look at the word Yahuda. We're told is Judah. One tribe of twelve. And Yahudim, which is all of Yah's people, plural. These are two different words. One does not originate from the other. No. But they both have their origin in the same word, which is what? Yahu, Yahuwah, God. That is significant. Yes, the New Testament uses the word in Greek, translated as Jews inappropriately, but 
The lost tribes of the northern kingdom were no longer in Israel at that point. So, yes, it referred to Judea because they were the only ones there that were left at that point in Israel. But to say that it only refers to Judea is not even remotely accurate. And we prove this in our Lost Tribes series as the first ecclesia in Antioch was, according to scripture, only Jews. Well, again, we know that word is not Jews. It's Yahudim, Yah's people. The thing is, the disciples were told to go to the lost tribes first. And it just so happens that Antioch is a territory considered to be a Kurdish territory or lost tribes of the North Territory, where they migrated to eventually. Yahudim are not just Judea. They are all 12 tribes. They are not just Judah or Yehuda, but they are all 12 tribes. But let's take a look at the word interpreted Jew in the New Testament, Greek, because we are not being told the truth regarding that word at all. Here's the Greek word used 199 times throughout the New Testament, translated as either Jew or Jews today. But again, that's a new transliteration, never used before the Renaissance. We are going to prove to you it's actually not different from Yahudi, but the same word. Everyone knew the origin of this word was Hebrew. That's no surprise, and nothing anyone can debate when they took it into the Greek. It remained principally the same word as it should. We know it's not what you have likely heard, but we'll prove it out as always. The next video is right behind this one, already recorded and uploading, if not already. We'll prove out the Greek word, which is really the same as the Hebrew, not different as we are told, and go deeper into the origin of this word, Jew, which is certainly not Hebrew and will prove not Greek in any sense. Where did it originate? Well, it may surprise many. Hint, it's not Israel. Thank you for watching the Name of God series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell and view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.